guys and welcome back to my channel or hello if you're new my name is Emma thank you very much for waiting very patiently for this video if you guys haven't seen it already though my other video everything I bought in lockdown is linked right there for you but yeah I actually read I'm gonna call this a surprising amount I'm really shocked at this this is usually how big the pile is for like everything I read in the year I am so impressed myself. So I managed to read how many things? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I read eleven things over like what like twenty weeks? That's almost like a one it's one one every two weeks. Um I'm dyslexic if you didn't know. I've got a bunch of videos on that over there. Help yourselves. I like that I get to be like all the other booktubers and actually have like a decent stack to show you so I'm hella vibing this. So some of these will look familiar from my last video. Some of these will look familiar from my readathon video. That went down so well with you guys. Thank you for like the love on that. I really, really enjoyed making it. So I'm so happy that you guys enjoyed it. It's linked there if you guys haven't seen it there and if you're new. Oh yeah, the other thing. What's my intro as well now? It's like, or if you're new, Complete grad, film student, there we go. And this pile absolutely reflects that. I will quickly start with everything I did read in the readathon so that I don't like spend too much time on that. So for my readathon that I did, I read Susan Sontag, Notes on Camp, Sappho, Stone with Love, Poems and Fragments, Nancy Mitford, Frederick the Great, and Chari Jones, An American Marriage. The Sontag I bought because it's what the Met Gala last year was based on, and I just wanted to sort of really I guess understand the concepts and the, I guess the theory behind what everyone was wearing. So for me it's like a cultural moment, I enjoyed having that contextualization and sort of then understanding what people's interpretation of camp is and like why they chose to do that. Um, I think for me the main thing it distills down to is camp being an attitude. You can wear as many feathers as you like but if you don't have camp as like a sensibility or like a way of being Honey, that ain't camp. It was just nice to like sort of, I don't know, get it. It made me feel very like fashiony and like high culture artsy. The other essay in here actually is a discussion about like high culture and low culture and like, can you almost, it's not the exact option you use, but can you almost reconcile like an enjoyment of like Aristotle, Plato, fine art and stuff with like an enjoyment of like pop culture and memes. Are those things mutually exclusive? Should they be? are we total pretentious twats for thinking they are? It's kind of a discussion of the like, get a girl who can do both memes. For contextualizing a cultural moment and just, you know, a way of being as camp is, I think this was really fun to read. And also Sontag, you read her and she is, she exudes intelligence. I would like to be this clever. I will never be this clever, but please can I try and be this clever? And like, I feel really important every time I understand a reference she makes, so. Maybe I read Sontag for the entertainment and massaging of my own ego, but I do very, very much enjoy her stuff. I read her Regarding the Pain of Others. It's this, I bought that in my book shop tour video, which is now my second most watched thing on my channel. I feel like what have I done? But hopefully lots of you are here because of that. I really like Sontag. I highly, highly recommend her. Then we have Sappho. Ah, uh, Sappho. You sometimes just want more things with sapphic energy. I think this might actually be the gayest thing on my bookshelf. That is so disappointing. I was talking about decolonializing my bookshelf. I need to like unstraighten my fucking bookshelf. But like in maybe a 20th, 21st century kind of way. Okay, a lot of these like, where's Oscar Wilde? Where's my homoerotic subtext? I mean, yeah, and then hopefully Homer gets really fucking gay too and shit. But like, I want something that is more above board, very like, not in your face LGBT, Q plus, but more like in the modern sense, because obviously we talk about the Greeks and stuff, but like it's not really because of the context of like, the, it doesn't exist as an idea in the same way that it does with us, so it's not really the same thing. So I think I just need some like more modern LGBTQ plus stuff to hit really hit the spot. At least this was all the sapphic energy you needed. Can we just have more sapphic energy in general, please? It's a, it's a good thing, I promise. I also annotated this in pink. I had such a good time with this. I tried to read it in my, my readathon. You can't read poetry in a readathon. Actually, that was my mistake. I put this by my bedside table and then like every night I just read a different one. And it's so fun because poetry is something that you, I read, I, you'd read it once and then I'd read it again and then I'd enjoy the notes and then I would go through with my little pink pen and like have a look at everything. One of the reasons that some things in classics you still read today is because they resonate so much even now in terms of you know they tap into like what it is to be 
a person or what it is, like the human experience. Maybe on its most basic levels, um, or most primal levels, when we talk about like society, when we talk about love and stuff, that is something that is always the fucking same. It comes in so many different variations, but I think a lot of the core things, and as well, when you're describing the feeling of love and like falling in love, that is very much a universe of the human experience. Unless you're a fucking psychopath. I rewatched American Psycho recently. But it's just like what it for me is like what it is to be human and then obviously what it is when you like girls. So that's great too. We need just need more I want a bust of Sappho. I'm one of those. I want a bust of Sappho and I'm gonna keep all my hats on it. Yeah. I know you guys enjoy this look at all the and I also enjoy like the now cult following that Sappho has like in the 21st century. And cult is the right word because obviously with the Greeks you have like what every god like their following is a cult. It's not really religion, it's a cult. I just enjoy the worship of Aphrodite in this and I'm thinking for my film for this term uh, for school I'm going along the lines of like Venus which is you know Aphrodite's Roman counterpart. I think the way that the goddesses of love are being used, I guess reappropriated now as like a symbolic and mythological thing for a new generation. I just think it's really fun and really cool. So it's just interesting how that works. And especially because like, I think female love needs more symbols. So there you go. That is then why you end up with Venus and Aphrodite. Um, even when you actually though read them and like the Iliad and the Odyssey and stuff like that, they're terrible people, like they're terrible gods and stuff. But I just think that the new cult following is really interesting. And this is obviously just great. I'm talking about them a lot, but I promise, I know this is stuff I haven't said in those other videos because I have new thoughts. And also I didn't, I guess, revise <laughs> for this video. So, ah, like I said, fucking love Nancy Mitford. I love her so much. And I read Frederick the Great. A little bit left field, but I think Frederick the Great is interesting. I guess he, his importance isn't stated enough. And I think potentially having gone through a UK curriculum, that's kind of understandable. Frederick the Great is obviously, he's Prussian, so that's where Germany sort of is. And I guess in the aftermath of World War II and stuff, they just didn't talk about it that much. Mitford even sort of talks about that a little bit of why she chose to talk about Frederick the Great. Obviously knowing that one of her, a couple of her sisters are Nazi sympathizers, that's kind of like, a little bit dodge, but you know, it's interesting. I really enjoy her biographies, they're very gossipy, it's all about the royals, and always done on a very personal, uh, personable level. She tries to get you to see them as human beings, and not just historic, like lofty historical figures that are totally untouchable and never had any human emotions or never made any mistakes. Obviously in doing that she assumes a lot, but it's fun, I like them. They see more flesh and blood than like a big fancy painting, or like a statue of them on a horse. You know, you kind of try and see them as people. Which you're entitled to do at your discretion, I guess, with her books. Because you know that she's taking liberties. But always entertaining and always fun. The reason I read this one last was because, yeah, I'm not as interested in Frederick the Great. But I am interested in Mitford's writing. So, that's why I read this. Then I read Tara Jones and American Marriage. I did enjoy this. And I read this quite quickly once I got into it. Now that I'm thinking of this in the context of Black Lives Matter, I didn't think I saw this on any reading lists. Or I think it does actually actually maybe deserve a spot on that. This book isn't about race, that's not like its main thing. I think it just takes the racial discrimination and racism as just so matter of fact and so part and parcel of their lives and the way that it overarchs so much for Celestial and Roy. It's awful because it's not like outright said and it's not like outright the point. And I know that she doesn't want to make it the point, but it's just so matter of fact that it's just painful because you know that this book could never have happened if they were white like the story just wouldn't have happened if they're white and so if they were white the entire book would have been about the court case and trying to prove that Roy isn't guilty the only words Celestial and Roy are the embodiment of the American dream he is a young executive and she is an artist on the brink of an exciting career until one day they are ripped apart by circumstances neither could have imagined Roy is arrested and sentenced to 12 years for a crime Celestial knows he didn't commit it's heartbreaking. And also just on the level of relationships, no relationship in this book was easy. They all, all were having like affairs or had been married once before or already had children. And I think in that sense, it does paint a very, you know, a very good picture of modern marriage and that this stuff isn't easy. And the lie we're told of like, you'll meet someone, you'll fall in love, you'll get married, you'll have kids, you'll live happily ever after. Bullshit. Who the, f who, who the fuck does it actually happen for? If you think about, you know, your own life and like 
your friends and stuff. Very few people, very, it's in my own, very few people end up with the whole like, you know, simple narrative that way. Because just life is so not simple. And I think this book, especially for the States, does such a good job of showing that and just like trying to explain to you like, look, the shit is never easy when it comes to relationships, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to like, you know, wanting to have kids, or trying to fall in love or whatever. It's complicated. Family as well is very complicated. The main marriages this book focuses on are Celestial and Roy's and then their parent, their respective parents. This is definitely worth your time. Then a couple of things that I read at the beginning of the year, I think I mentioned, I think I talked about these in my lockdown vlog. So that was, I rewatched that and I can't get over the fact that it was in April. I basically lived that week on repeat for just weeks on end. This is Albert Camus' Created Dangerously. This is Samuel Beckett's The End. These are some of the Penguin Modern editions for like a quid. Defo worth, defo worth the money. I can't believe I actually bought these and read them all in the same year, no way. I think these are transcripts of lectures he gave at, not La Académie Française, but a, a couple of different speeches actually. I don't like it. I don't really like Camus. I've never vibed with him particularly. Where is it if it's gone? I've read this of his, his short stories, Albert Camus, Exile and the Kingdom stories. I just didn't enjoy it that much. And Create Dangerously, I guess yes, he talked about taking risks and whatever, but didn't think it was that good and I think Camus is difficult. There are some like authors and like especially like the fucking existentialists like they just get off on being difficult they just enjoy being hard to read and hard to understand like Sartre for example for fuck's sake. Camus is just too miserable for me he's also very hard and quite convoluted to follow I know these are speeches but fuck me I still have fallen asleep he's not someone I like reading this killed some brain cells. I did not enjoy this. <laughs> they were not worth the sacrifice. Oof Fucking scathing. I just don't like Camus. I think he's fucking miserable. Someone else who's miserable, but at least is funny about it, is Samuel Beckett. You know, you know that I love Beckett. You know that I love Godot. So this is two short stories about two vagrants, homeless people who are wandering around France and just sort of, I guess they are just waiting for their deaths. It's that kind of just waiting until that next and very fine, for the, in this, this case it is that very final step. Arguably deaths they shouldn't be thinking towards, but it's just because of, you know, their circumstance that obviously that's on their mind. Um, and in the end, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Or is it just what's that, what Beckett decides to do? The characters are miserable. The circumstances are miserable, but it's funny. Beckett is always funny. Beckett makes being miserable funny to the point where it's almost not enjoyable but it's almost enjoyable with Camus he's miserable and he wallows in it Beckett just thinks it's fucking funny when things are bad and when things are miserable and really you, you've got you, you're at the point where you have those two options which are or you laugh or you cry why the fuck would you cry when you can laugh like does it not make everyone feel better to just laugh about how shit everything is especially right now and i read this at the beginning of the pandemic when like what when like a thousand people were dying a day like that is so really fucking awful and it's miserable so just find like not necessarily something to cheer you up in like in like a really like fun like superficial sense but just it's so just awful sometimes that all you can do is laugh and honestly sometimes you should because fuck otherwise your mental health takes such a fucking hit given the choice of those two things always laugh yeah that is why i make self-deprecating jokes and stuff that's why you do because yeah or you can feel shit about it or you can laugh about it and that will always make you feel better always love beckett godo has mentally fucked me so much that I think I, it's shaped so much of my worldview and just who I am as a person. If I have to choose one, te I know Roxana is my favorite. If I have to choose one text that has just completely shaped my attitude and who I am, it's Godot, it's waiting for Godot. It's just theater of the absurd and just absurdism is for me such a great way of seeing the world because every nothing shit doesn't make sense it is so hard to try and make sense of the world as an individual as one person can you really start to try and make sense of the entire world i've struggled to make sense of my world like and beck acknowledges that Beckett knows you can't do that Beckett it knows it's fucking hard and i think that's why absurdism especially in the 19 
40s, 50s, 60s. I think that's why it resonated with so many people. Like those are generations who've gone through, some of them not just one, but two world wars, like, yeah, shit's miserable, you laugh. And you don't need to make sense of everything. And I guess absurdism is a little bit more like, go with the flow and just like, ugh. Absurdism knows, but it doesn't have all the answers. And it's okay with that. And I think maybe we should be more okay with that. And absurdism knows that we don't know everything, we'll never know everything. You just laugh about it. It's okay, it doesn't need to feel that overwhelming and like existential. It could just be funny too. I have some notes at the back. Do you want my notes at the back? At least Becky doesn't romanticize their homelessness and desperate states. It's true, he doesn't. It's shit, literally full of shit. <laughs> Beckett was still pretty privileged though. He did, you know you like fucked Penny Guggenheim? Do you guys know that? Patty Beckett shagged a lot of people. Apparently so did Peggy Guggenheim. That's not the point. It's dark and it's dissociative. It's like you're floating through fog, grasping for sense, or wading through a vast ocean that's only knee deep. Might see a fish, might even catch one, but you'll never see land even if the sea is only two feet deep. Trust me on the metaphors, Beckett doesn't make sense any other way. He's an absurdist after all, it's not meant to make sense. It also doesn't need to. And you can argue there's something really freeing in that, isn't there? Once you let go of trying to make sense of everything around you and you just like enjoy whatever you can about your life and about where you are and also not thinking always about the next step, Beckett doesn't have a next step. That's why I like it. Beckett never is about the future. Beckett is always about the here, the now, and your literal experience of you living right now. And of your being, just of your, just be. Like sometimes you don't need to think about everything that's gonna come and worry about tomorrow or next week or next year or where you're gonna be and what next steps you need to take about the fact that you need to graduate and then after you graduate you need to get a job and after you get a job you need to get a house and after you get a house you need to get a dog and then you need to get married and then you need to have kids and that is not on Beckett's radar. That is not a fucking problem. It's not a problem to begin with and we shouldn't think about it like that. But Beckett is about the here and the right fucking now. Because honestly, if you think about it, the fact that we stress about all of those things is absurd in and of itself. So Beckett is about the here and the now and helps us try and make sense about feeling like you're floating and you really don't know what the fuck is going on. It'll all be fine. Just, just go with it. Just go with it. I need to speed this the fuck up. I read Sard. I did it. I finally, 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 finally fucking finished Juliet. No, not Juliet. Justine. I read half of this last year. And I read half of it now. I've, I love Sard. I just do. This, he's just fucking batshit. He's fucking batshit fucking crazy. This is a very, very episodic narrative. It's like one thing happens, but another thing happens, but another thing happens. And you're literally there like, fucking hell, can this poor girl just catch a fucking break? And Saad alternates between long philosophical digression, porn. Long philosophical digression, porn. It's lots of words making dirty images in your, your head. So it's not for the faint of heart. And obviously, Saad. So where we get the word sadism from? Saad's putting the S. <laughs> Saad has put in the S and BDSM since uh, the 18th century. This better not be what I get remembered for. Libertinism, obviously, pushing boundaries. And it is about extremes. It's about extremes for the sake of extremes. And it's about doing what you can because you fucking want to and because you can. Um, obviously libertinism, I guess, is very much reserved for the tops of the patriarchal system. It's for the richest men, the richest white men only. Which obviously we know Saad was, so Marquis de Saad. That is a system that profits you and only you at the expense of everyone else. So reading Saad is heavy. <laughs> it's heavy, but it's fascinating. Simone de Beauvoir. Simone de Beauvoir? Simone. Sim Simone. Simone de Beauvoir has an essay, Must Be Bernsard. I've never read it, I really want to read it. I'm fascinated to see what she thinks of it. But I think if you guys are feminists, don't discount this. I definitely don't. Even though it's obviously like one of the most misogynistic fucking things you can read. But I guess that is what's so interesting about it. And I think that is what has drawn feminist scholars to Sard time and fucking time again. It's just so interesting. And I don't actually think every single view Sard has is misogynistic because it goes to such an extreme that there are some about the fight for female autonomy over our lives and our bodies. I guess to an extent, Justine represents that, even if the fact that she does that is what gets fucked over time and time again. But then again, 
Juliet is like the most autonomous. Juliet is Sud's sister. Juliet is Justine's sister. Justine is the misfortune of virtue. I think Juliet is the. Oh, honey, what's Juliet? Is she the, is she the virtues of vice? Oh no, all the books have fallen over. And you can tell them in my pajamas. Prosperities of vice. Please don't demonetize me because it's got a tit on it. <laughs> you know this edition? Came with pictures. I'm about to show you porn if you don't want to just close your eyes for two seconds. Yeah. I don't know if Justine was meant to have um, engravings as well. There aren't any in this one. It does help when he's trying to like explain where people are and you're like, this, uh, this is lost on me now. I always worry about recommending Zard. I don't know if this is necessarily something that every single person ever needs to read. It may be probably best if you're over the age of 16 because you maybe don't want to like warp any of your ideas and stuff. I mean, same goes for just watching pornography as is. This is obviously still pornography and it is pretty extreme. Not for the faint of heart. If you can stomach that, I think it is so worth reading. I just think it's is fascinating. I always have. I will probably read a lot more of his stuff. I will probably read all of Juliet because this is volume one. Juliet is actually about a thousand pages. He is consistently one of the most fascinating people I've read. Okay, let's quickly talk about Mitford. I love Nancy Mitford, you know I love Nancy Mitford, I love her so much. The narrator talks about her cousin and about her cousin's endeavours in love and finding love and how it all really goes to fucking shit. It really goes to shit. Has a similar feeling to American marriage in that way, but it's not simple. Like the whole find person, get married, have babies, live happily ever after. That's not for Nancy Mitford. I think she calls bullshit on it pretty fucking well. And about how some people just seem to struggle. Do you not find that like, I don't know if maybe it's you, how some people are like really good at relationships and then just some people aren't. I just think that Linda, she's like the protagonist, but she's not the narrator. Our uh, narrator is actually very good at relationships and she finds a nice man and she has a few kids and she's very, very happy. Linda, no, 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 not Linda. She's one of those people who seems to need greatness and she goes through a couple of different lovers. She has her first marriage. She does every, she takes every box. She takes every box with her first husband. He's rich, he's gonna be a politician, he's a banker. And like on paper, in every single way, this man is meant to be perfect, but it all goes to shit so spectacularly. And even having her child with him, which is what you know she's supposed to do, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't fix anything. Wow, what a concept. Having a baby doesn't fix a marriage. But I just, in terms of like, yeah, the pursuit of... I was literally gonna go when in the term of pursuit of love, which was me talking about the title of the book, but I wasn't meant to do that. That just happened. But it really is when you're like going after something because you want it so badly, you, you're gonna fuck it up a few times. And in my experience, I think the people who try and pursue love the hardest are often the ones who fail the hardest as well which is like a super morbid maybe thing to say but that's just what I've noticed um that's why I personally am just chilling out right now I'm like hey, someone will find me I don't know what's going on I don't think it's like essential for every single person to read it I really enjoyed it it's as I said in my other video it's similar to Brighthead, this is obviously elite category, but it's similar to Brighthead in the fact that it's that interval, like sort of golden interval period. I really, really enjoyed both of these, and it's that kind of, it is that like, again, if we're giving a nuance view on it, it's a nostalgic wanting for a world which favours their class over absolutely everyone else, no matter what the cost. Which is obviously the world Nancy Mitford herself was brought up into, so obviously she doesn't comment on class because, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you, but it's great. I really, like I said, I mind the video. I just want to be Linda, you know, sunbathing topless on the terrace of your Parisian lover's apartment. If that isn't a fucking mood, I don't know what the fuck is. Next I read, I'm gonna quickly dash this off because there's one book left that I really want to talk about. So I've been reading, I haven't finished it yet, but I've been reading On Filmmaking by Alexander McKendrick. This is a very practical book on filmmaking. It's been recommended about a million times for our course and if I don't read it by the time we go back I am so gonna get a bollocking. This is very interesting. It's basically teaching you, yeah it's teaching you the basics but it's teaching you all the shit you really need to know and once you know all of that then you can start deviating from it. I unfortunately am one of those people who if you tell me to do something I'm gonna go and want to do the opposite thing. You need to know what the rules are first then you can do it. On Letterbox, I've made a list of all of the films that McKendrick talks about, so I will link that down for you below. But those of you who are interested in film on a practical level, 
and want to make things, this is what you need to read. If you just want to watch films, definitely not essential. This is really only for the people who make films. Um, and I know some of you do, so this is what you need to read. I'm 80 pages in and I think it has already made an impact on me, but it's just a slightly dull bit now. Like, some of it is really dull, I'm not gonna lie. It's because it's so practical, it, it is quite like dull. It's not like juicy or exciting in the way that reading about failed romances is, but it's, you you do it, you're getting the job done. Let me just look, I am annotating, look at this. Woo. Oh, and Scorsese wrote, wrote the foreword. So if you make films, you need this. You're not gonna enjoy it, you're not gonna like it, but at the end of the day, I am gonna save it as essential. I don't need to fucking finish reading it. The last thing that I want to talk about, I cried to Amanda Ngozi Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun. In 1960s Nigeria, three lives intersect. Ukwu works as a houseboy for a university lecturer. Olana has abandoned her life of privilege to live with her charismatic lover, the lecturer. Richard, a shy Englishman, is enthralled with Alana's enigmatic twin sister. Amongst the horrors of Nigeria's civil war, loyalties are tested as they are pulled apart and thrown together in ways that none of them imagined. I cried so much when I finished reading this. I sobbed for maybe like half an hour. My friends didn't. So I was like, okay, maybe it just is me. I cried so much. I think I cried probably a lot more because I was reading about Yemen at the time. I will link below links to donate to the Yemen Appeal via the Red Cross and UNICEF. If you guys are interested, please like have a look at that because this is set during a civil war and it's just so painful to read. The main thing that you learn is there are no winners in the war. It doesn't matter who wins, nobody ever wins because so many people suffer. Um, and especially with the Nigerian Biafran civil war, it was famine. So many people, chill, so many children just starved to death because of the way that they um, cut off food supplies. You really feel that when you read this about how how the focus so is on trying to create food corridors and like trying to have any if any like relief planes can land um and just how there are just no winners in war you never win the cost of human life is ne is it ever worth it and i just think telling it from those perspectives as well that you have so you have ugru who's the houseboy so you do have a more i guess rural lower class view alana is very privileged and they're very rich um, what well, they were. They're very rich and then for her to then leave her life of privilege and then to just become a little a little bit more middle class I guess sort of shows that there's this one scene, probably spoilers sorry, um, but there is this one scene where the Red Cross are handing out food and Alana is really standing back because all of these people are rushing and fighting and shoving to try and get this food. Um, this is one of the first few times Alana has had to go for food um, for, to a relief centre and you can tell that there's part of her going, oh, I'm too good for this. This isn't happening to me as a person. Um, and I think the choice to have such a privileged character is really important because most of us are reading from that same level of privilege. Um, and we would probably also think, you know, I'm never gonna fight you know, with you over a, a tin of condensed milk. But when you are put in a point and you're driven to such a point of desperation, um, but yeah, of course, by the end, she she will she does do that, um, and she just sort of puts all of that superficiality aside because this is just about survival. It is just about making it to the next day, the next week, the next month. And also, as the novel progresses and the war gets worse, it's also reflected in the fact that each time their accommodation gets worse and worse, and that's always just a little bit sort of. To sort of adds to the claustrophobia, so you get this immediate physical claustrophobia of like, initially they're in a big house, then a slightly small house, then a you know, small house, then a room. So you essentially have that like choke, almost like a choke hold of the war on um, Biafra. So you have the like, I guess, the national choke hold on them, and then sort of that just personal choke hold on the space in which they live and the way that you can see that the things war will drive you to do there's just one i won't say what it is but this is one bit at the end of the novel with um ugu and it's just so oh uh, you like him you kind of basically love him the entire novel because you sort of see him grow up from a child to a teenager to a young adult um and then when he's essentially forcibly conscripted into the army he does do some horrible things and then you just can't you can't wrap your head around that because you know he's not a bad person. So I think the way war drives you to do awful, terrible, terrible things. We think about war as this like big, grand military thing, but you never necessarily focus enough 
on the cost, the very real cost of human life. And even if you don't die, your life is still very much impacted by it and just everything is different. And also just the sense of desperation. It's just very painful to read, but also like the pain and worry of a parent seeing like knowing that so many people have lost, lost their children and like fuck is your child next? To what extent can you protect them? And try and shield them from like the horrors of war. I could argue what she's trying to do is hit home that the horrors of war are not being shot and blown up on a battlefield. The horrors of war are just the civilian cost of life and the really awful ways that, and slow, slow deaths that a lot of these people suffer. So yeah, I cried a lot at the end. If you read it as well, I'm sure that won't shock any of you it's that I did. And also having Richard's point of view, because this is just after Nigeria's um, independence from the UK. So again, in terms of like, like colonial history, important to read. And I think Richard is an important character then to have with that regard. Alana is a privilege. Richard is, you know, the colonizer. And then even though obviously he has the deepest empathy and stuff, but still and then Ugo is like he's just so normal he's just such a normal boy and like it just it's almost like you're so normal that it boggles your mind that they could even get caught up in that but you know I mean obviously depending on the war it doesn't really take that many prisoners but what I can tell you without a fucking doubt is that this is even though I read all of this like this is the best thing that I read and I'm happy to say that I gave that five stars on Goodreads I didn't give a review on Goodreads even though I really wanted to because I knew my friends would read it and I wanted to talk to them about it. This is the best thing that I have read so far this year, and I do not doubt that this will be the best thing I read this year full stop. I'm happy to place bets on that. Absolutely worth your time. It's a joy, but this is 400 pages long, much more when it is daunting. She's just so matter of fact, in a similar way that Chari Jones is, but she's so matter of fact, and just sort of these things are just happening, and she knows that like, you as an individual can do so very little to change what is more happening on more national stage. I guess maybe then again it resonated because of the pandemic, because like, as an individual person, there is nothing I can do. There is very, very, very little that I, as an individual, will be able to do to stop this pandemic. Or for example, you know, stop a war. And it's so hard to feel like you've made a difference as well. So yeah, best thing that I've read. Out of everything that I've talked about, I recommend this the most. And I'm very happy to say that. I'm just gonna pause while I have to go to a therapy session. So for light changes, I apologize. And we're back, thank you very much for bearing with. The last book that I have read is Rennie Ella Lodge, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. It's only 200 pages, it's not that long and it's not particularly difficult. She is a journalist, but it's written very, it is written quite familiarly, 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 and quite colloquially as well. So it's definitely not challenging, I think, pretty much everyone can read it. You can always tell though that she's a journalist with just something about the writing. Like I said in my other video, I just, I don't think anybody in the UK has anything to lose reading this. You can only like benefit and gain from it. Even if you do know lots about black British history and even if you've, you know, started or like trying to like understand your own white privilege and stuff. Like even if you're doing all the good stuff and like what you're supposed to be doing, this will still help and it will still contribute. You will still gain something from reading it. Is this the best thing I've ever read? And is it the best thing I've ever written? No, but it also doesn't need to be. It fulfills very much something else, which is still very much needing to be covered. Like almost like it's trying to cover the basics of like black British history, um, talking about like London and riots and stuff and like the slave trade and then like about the Windrush generation, teaching you what you should arguably have been taught at school. One of the biggest chapters in it is on white privilege and also explaining like systemic racism and how that actually works and like talking about things like microaggressions and sort of stuff that in or maybe like a case by case basis, you could argue like, oh, how do you like, how do you know that for racism, whatever, but then when you contextualize it and see it within this bigger framework and when you see that these things, these individual instances happen time and time and time again, you're like, oh, okay, I see how this is all like working together. And I think, you know, as someone who is white who lives in this country, like I obviously do benefit from white privilege. So understanding the ways in which I maybe uphold that kind of system and like then the ways that you can obviously not do that. So I think it is definitely an interesting read and it's definitely worth your time. This is obviously 
the complex student in me talking, I feel like it would maybe benefit from some kind of theory, like academic theory, but then maybe the ones that spring to mind for me maybe are just like, you know, white theories. Um, I think we also need to be aware that a lot of the theories we used to talk about, like colour and blackness and whatever, a lot of those are still like white ideas. So like being aware of that as well, but just if she'd had some like other ones that weren't like white theories and stuff, I think it could have probably benefited a lot from that. But I, get, I kind of get that this is not what this book is trying to do. I don't know, I just think it would have added like another layer. If you're potentially somebody who might be put off by the fact that it's why I'm no longer talking to white people about race, then maybe you're the person he used to read it the most. I feel like we all definitely can benefit from reading it, especially those of us who are white, because no matter how uncomfortable you may get reading it, you've never experienced something as uncomfortable as racism. So, definitely worth reading. And that is everything that I have read in lockdown. I really have honestly impressed myself. I think a combination of reading more contemporary stuff and a bit less fiction, I think really has gone a long way. And yeah, I think I read a lot of good things. Like I said, Half of a Yellow Sun tore my heart out and made me cry a lot. So I think if you're gonna read one, read this one. I'm very happy with myself. The dyslexic in me does feel very accomplished. Let me know what you guys have read during lockdown. Let me know if you've read anything on that bin book list. I would actually really love to know. Let me know what you're reading at the moment. And te no, tell me what is the best thing that you read in all of lockdown. That's what I want to know. What is the one thing that really just really was the best? I think that's it for this video. I will have a playlist of all of my like book and film videos linked at the end for you. Like, subscribe and all my jazz. And I'll see you guys very soon. Bye. <laughs>